Take your Bible, if you would, to Isaiah chapter 8. Isaiah chapter 8. Turn there in your Bibles. Let me read to you out of um, 1 Peter. And uh, sort of the, uh, we're d- kind of doing a study of the book of 1 Peter. And we were in 1 Peter chapter 2. And it said, um, uh, verse 7, Unto you therefore which believe he is precious, but unto them which be disobedient, the stone which the builders disallowed, the same as made the head of the corner, and a stone of stumbling, and a rock of offense, uh, even to them which stumble at the word, being disobedient, whereunto also they were appointed. Uh, Peter specifically, I think in this case, he is referring to, uh, number one, the Jews, who the rock, Jesus Christ, was the rejected cornerstone. The Jews examined him, and because of the hardness of their heart, because of the idolatry, because of the a, th- a thousand years or whatever of them just being blatantly disobedient to God, they rejected the very cornerstone that God had established for them and for building their kingdom. So th- to them, Jesus was an offense to them. And I'll show you some places where it talks about that in the scripture here tonight. And so, he was the stone of stumbling and a rock of offense to Israel. They they stumbled right over the very stone that they used, or that they could have and should have used, to build their kingdom and to build their nation and establish it uh, with God as their king, God as their leader. They were looking for a stone to build with, and they stumbled over the very stone they should have used. And they were offended at that, and so they disallowed Jesus Christ. And they went chasing after some other. Did you know that to this day, they've never found it. Jews have not found a decent Messiah. They've had several candidates. I'd probably say several hundred candidates over the 2,000 years' time. They've never settled on who the Messiah is because they've never chosen Jesus Christ. One of these days, they will. But for now, Israel is offended at the cross, they are offended at the New Testament, they're offended at the gospel, they're offended at Jesus Christ, and they don't like us Gentiles very much. They don't mind taking our money. It's kind of like the Amish. I like getting around the Amish people, and we like going to their uh, uh, neighborhoods and places like that, and go to their stores and everything like that. Amish don't like us English very much, but they sure don't mind taking our money. Okay? But anyway, so that's kind of how the Jews are right now. Now I want you to think about Things that can be offensive. Things that can be offensive. All right? I want you to plant that in your mind. And uh, let's move forward in the scripture. Where Peter was getting this from was, of course, Isaiah chapter 8, verse 13. Sanctify the Lord of hosts himself, and let him be your fear, and let him be your dread. And he shall be for a sanctuary, but for a stone of stumbling, and for a rock of offense to both houses of Israel. Both Judah and the ten tribes of Israel both stumbled over Christ and refused Him, rejected Him. For a gin and for a snare to the inhabitants of Jerusalem. Now that is not a bottle of gin. The word gin, I did a little study on that. It is related to the word engine. A mechanical device. A gin is a snare. was a sort of like a mechanical trap. All right? And that's to them that when Jesus came in the form of which he came in, that was a setup for Israel. God knowing that they would reject him. And so they did. To both houses of Israel uh, uh, and the inhabitants of Jerusalem. Verse 15, And many among them shall stumble and fall and be broken and be snared and be taken. Bind up the testimony, seal the law among my disciples. If you look at, uh, go to Isaiah 28. I think it is, yes, Isaiah 28. You'll see another, uh, sort of another version of this. In Isaiah 28, 11, For with stammering lips and another tongue will he speak to this people. Stammering lips was Moses. God spoke to Israel through a stammerer, Moses. That's why they don't understand. That's why they don't understand the law. 
They don't understand it. They can't understand it because Moses was a stammerer. But then, another tongue. When God established the new covenant, He established it in a new language. Not Hebrew. This also was a gin and a snare to them. And here, think about it. Here Jesus comes along, last book of the Bible, book of Revelation. He says, I am the Alpha and Omega. First and last letter of the Greek alphabet, not the Hebrew alphabet. That was, the, that was an offense to Israel. Israel wanted their Messiah to speak Hebrew, want to be one of these good Jewish boys. Going to speak Hebrew, going to speak the language of our forefathers. Here Jesus comes along and he says, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabai, and they have no idea what he's saying. And then he comes along and says, I am the Alpha and the Omega. If the Jews, for all of those, what, 90 some odd years, had their questions about Christ, it was settled right then and there. He's establishing a new covenant in a new language. This was an offense to them. Because Greek was the language of the Gentiles, and they knew it, and they wanted nothing to do with it. How dare the Apostle Paul go out preaching and writing his epistles in that Greek language? How dare he do that? Leave the language of his forefathers. How dare he do that? Well, he's just preaching to whom God told him to preach. And he said, if the Jews won't accept me, here, go speak Greek to all the Greeks out here. They'll accept you, because you'll come preaching in their language. So anyway, he said, stammering lips in another tongue, will he speak to this people? Uh, verse 12, to whom he said, this is the rest wherewith you may cause the weary to rest, and this is the refreshing, yet they would not hear. God, God would have given them their time of rest and refreshing at this time, but they wouldn't hear it. So this is what he said, but the word of the Lord was unto them precept upon precept, precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line, here a little and there a little. And look at it, what it says again, that they might go and fall backward and be broken and snared and taken. God had, God had every intention of tripping Israel up and causing them to fall. Why? Because the fall of them is the rising up of the Gentiles and the salvation of the Gentiles. So now think about this. Paul deals with this in Romans chapter 11. So if he says, if the fall of them be for the glory of the, of the Gentiles rising up to Israel, how much more then the fall of the Gentiles be for the glory of the rising up of Israel? God's going to save his people, amen? He's going to save his people. So now, uh, let me just run through some. I got something very important I want to share with you tonight, so I'm going to move through some of this very quickly and kind of understand what he's saying here. In Matthew 11:6, 6, Blessed is he whosoever shall not be offended in me. The Jews rejected Jesus. Even Peter, even Peter the Jew, the night that Jesus was, uh, uh, the night before Jesus was to be crucified, what did Peter do three times? Third time he did what? He cursed. He was offended. What, what do you call me, a, a, a Christian? <laughs> I never. Okay? Matthew 13, 21. Now, let me just, let me stop right here and apply this. Young people, listen to me. Listen to preacher tonight. Don't ever be ashamed to tell people you go to church. Don't ever be ashamed of your Bible. Don't be ashamed of the God that saves you. Don't be ashamed of him. You don't have anything to be afraid of. You don't owe anybody any apology. You are a Christian. You go to a Bible-believing church. It's not popular nowadays. But there's nothing wrong with what you do, and there's nothing wrong with what we believe. Don't be offended by Jesus Christ. Whoso and blessed is he, whosoever shall not be offended in me. Matthew 13, 21, yet hath he not rooted himself. Here's, here's your um, stony ground people. What is the deal with stony ground people? They get offended. Yet hath he not rooted himself, but doeth for a while, for when tribulation or persecution arises because of the word, by and by he is offended. Some people 
They think this salvation deal is pretty good. They think this, oh, I'll, maybe I can get saved and I can go to heaven and have all my sins. Oh, that sounds good. But then you got, you've seen it, you've seen it, you've seen it, I've seen it, we've all seen it, where somebody will come in for a while until the wrong thing is preached to them. And when the wrong thing gets preached to them, they're out. They say, I never, uh, listen, that, I, that, that, he offended me. That preacher, that preacher knew what I was doing and singled me out in front of everybody. I don't think that's right. First of all, the preacher did no such thing. The Holy Ghost did. I don't sit and... I, listen, I don't call Google and get your search history. But that's what happens. They get offended. Something out of this Bible gets preached. You can talk to... I, I give you a whole phone list of preachers to call and ask them, has anybody ever been offended at things that you preach right out of the Bible and left your church? Every one of them is going to say, yeah. And nowadays it seems to be happening more and more. Matthew 13, verse 54, when he's coming to his own country, watch this now. Jesus came to his own country. He taught them in their synagogue, insomuch that they were astonished and said, Whence hath this man this wisdom and these mighty works? Is not this the carpenter's son? Is not his mother called Mary and his brethren James, Joseph, and Simon, and Judas? And his sisters, are they not all with us? Whence then hath this man all these things? And they were offended in him. But Jesus said unto them, The prophet is not without honor, save in his own country and in his own house. Did you know that at the time of Jesus' ministry, his own brothers, his half-brothers, mocked him? His own brethren made fun of him and tried to provoke him. They were not even, I, I would say that not even James, the half-brother of Jesus who wrote the book of James, I would say that not at this time, James himself is not a believer. He's mocking his own brother. Because the Bible's going to be true. A prophet is not without honor, save in his own country. That means that Jesus had fame and honor everywhere he went, except right there at home. They didn't like him. They didn't want anything to do with him. Okay? And he did, mighty, he did not many mighty works there because of their unbelief. They just wouldn't believe in him. Matthew chapter 15, verse 10. And he called the multitude and said unto them, Hear and understand, not that which goeth into the mouth defileth a man, but that which cometh out of the mouth, this defileth a man. And see, I've spent my whole life hearing people say, Oh, you shouldn't eat that. Well, why not? Well, that's, that, that'll, uh, that'll defile you. That's, that's pork. You shouldn't eat that. I did a, one of the first meetings I did for Stan Johnson was down at his little place down there in Dallas, Texas, and they, the plane landed late, and he literally grabbed me from the airport, and he said, do you want anything to eat? And we passed a Whataburger. You know Whataburger? Oh, it's the best grease in the world! And I said, yeah, pull, Stan, pull in there. I want to get me one of them double bacon cheeseburgers. And so I did, I wolfed it down, and I happened to mention that during the meeting, and after the meeting, these three or four people came and just, I mean, attacked me. What are you doing eating that bacon? It's good. Oh, that files you, that, don't you know we should... I said, don't give me that stuff. Now listen, I'm tired, and I didn't come 500 miles to stand here and argue with people about keeping the law. But you show, you show me, you show me. Okay, and we, I don't even, I, we got into it. Never, needless to say, we got into it. But anyway, they were offended because I had said bacon, and they were offended. Okay, it found out they were like Hebrew roots people, people who act like Jews. And I can tell you, even the people who act like Jews are so much like the Jews because they get offended when you say the word bacon. Okay, that's the Hebrew roots people for you. So verse 12, then came his disciples, said unto him, Knowest thou that the Pharisees were offended after they heard this saying? Why, Jesus, you need to understand just how much power and influence Pharisees had. 
Now, maybe some of his disciples thought, you know, if Jesus could kind of get in big with the Pharisees, why, he could just really reach people. And Jesus was not at all interested in getting in big with the Pharisees. But he answered and said, Every plant which my heavenly Father hath not planted shall be rooted up. Let them alone. They be blind leaders of the blind. And if the blind lead the blind, both shall fall into the ditch. People get offended. I've pastored for, since, what, 1990? And I can tell you, people get offended. Preacher says something, people get offended. Now, sometimes it's the preacher's fault. Sometimes it's been my fault. I get it. But there's been times when my heart was in the right place, I was preaching the word of God, and people just get offended. Okay? You know what they did? They stone of stumbling and a rock of offense, and they stumbled over the stone that they should have used to be the cornerstone of their life. But they, they got offended at it, and they said, well, I don't want to hear that, and so they leave. Okay? That's what happens. Matthew 24, 10, And then shall many be offended, and shall betray one another, and shall hate one another. I've pastored churches long enough to know that in churches, that happens. People get offended at something I say. People get offended at things that I don't say, that they think I should have said. People get offended at something that somebody else said, or something that somebody else did. They get offended, they start betraying one another, and they start hating one another. Boom. Then you got a big church split. Okay? I have, I have lived long enough in this world, and I've been in this church long enough, I saw a church split when I was about 12 or 13 years old in this church, and I swore I would never want to see another one. It was the worst thing I've ever seen in my life. I saw people offended. I saw people who were uh, very offensive. I saw a woman get up and slap the face of a deacon, a godly man, in this church, sitting about right where you are, Megan. Okay? I mean, I've seen it all. And then I've seen people trying to sneak off and have an affair out here in our parking lot. Okay? I mean, I've seen it all. And I've seen people betray one another, be offended at one another, and hate one another in church. Now, take your Bible, turn to the book of Proverbs, chapter 18. Book of Proverbs, chapter 18. There's one verse here, but I want you to underline it. I want you to underline it. I'm going to try to move through this. If you'll give me a few minutes tonight, I'm going to, I'm going to get you to examine your soul and your life. I think I asked you last week, who in here has ever offended somebody? Proverbs 18, 19. A brother offended. Now notice who it's talking about. A brother. Not some guy that passed you on the highway that you don't know. A brother. A brother offended is harder to be one than a strong city and their contentions are like the bars of a castle. How easy is it to break through the bars of a castle? Nearly impossible. How easy is it to appease and bring peace to a situation where you offended a brother, a sister, a friend, a husband, a wife? How easy is that? This Bible's right. That's why I wanted you to underline that. If you've never seen that verse before, you're going to know it tonight. Now, keep that in mind and take your Bible, turn to John chapter 11. John chapter 11. I'm going to preach for just a little bit tonight. Is that all right? Okay? Those of you online, get ready. 
I want you to have your Bible open. I want you to pay attention to what the Bible says. This was one of the hardest messages I ever had to sit through. It's one thing to listen to Reg Kelly on tape. You can shut him off when you want to. But when he's standing here preaching it in your church, it's hard to tell him, now Reg, would you stop preaching for a little while? That's enough. Okay? I couldn't do it. What I was doing was sitting in the church pew, squirming, hurting, under deep conviction. John eleven eighteen. 18. Now Bethany was nigh unto Jerusalem, about 15 furlongs, furlongs off. And many of the Jews came to Martha and Mary to comfort them concerning their brother. Then Martha, as soon as she heard that Jesus was coming, went and met him. But Mary sat still in the house. Then said Martha unto Jesus, Lord, if thou hadst been here, my brother had not died. Now I want you to look at this. So I'm going to give you the characters here. Jesus is Jesus. He's the Savior. Lazarus is somebody that you know that is lost. It is somebody that you know that is lost. Or somebody that is backslid and out of church. The Bible says when you're lost that you're dead in trespasses and sins. So Lazarus is a lost family member. He's a lost friend. He's a lost co-worker. Or he's a, let's say he's a former church member. Backslid. Okay? Maybe not even really saved yet. Martha is a typical church member. She is all about assigning blame for Lazarus being dead. Lord, it's your fault. Why, if you would have been here, my brother had not died. Now, what Martha is guilty of is going to be apparent here in a little bit. Okay? Verse 22, But I know that even now whatsoever thou wilt ask of God, God will give it thee. Jesus saith unto her, Thy brother shall rise again. Martha said unto him, I know that he shall rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Jesus said unto her, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me, shall never die. Believest thou this? She saith unto him, Yea, Lord, I believe that thou art the Christ, the Son of God, which should come into the world. Now verse 28. All right. Somebody pray, okay? Verse 28. When she had so said... She went her way and called Mary, her sister, secretly, saying, The Master has come and called her for thee. As soon as she heard that, she arose quickly and came unto him. Now Jesus was not yet come into the town, but was in that place where Martha met him. The Jews then, which were with her in the house, and comforted her, when they saw Mary, that she rose up hastily and went out, followed her, saying, She goeth unto the grave to weep there. Then when Mary was come where Jesus was and saw him, she fell down at his feet, saying unto him, Lord... Here it is again. If thou hadst been here, my brother had not died. Now, there's something here that's just knocking at my door, and I don't know if I should... When it says there in 31, where it says, She goeth unto the grave to weep there. A lot of times, we'll talk about somebody in our family that's lost. And we'll act real spiritual about it. Oh, I just wish they would get saved. I just wish they would get saved. Oh, I want to see them saved so bad. And every time they come around, the same family members are all about nailing them about how they're living, what they're doing, how bad they are, how guilty they are. Let me express something to you that really changed my attitude about lost people. Lazarus is dead, and Lazarus has been dead four days. We, in today's world, cannot expect lost 
people to live the way church people live. They're lost. They're dead. They have sin in their heart. That sin is just coming out and it's just rampant and running loose. And they stink of it. They smell like cigarettes and they smell like alcohol and they smell like dirty words and they smell like sin. And every time they come around, oh, well, you'll have to, and we get real indignant about, well, that's my, that's my brother-in-law, he's, he's lost, don't pay no attention to him. But then we're out at the grave going, oh, I wish they would get saved. This, this is Christian fundamentalism 101. Us fundamentalists can be the most hateful, arrogant, spiteful, holier-than-thou people in the entire world. No wonder people don't want to come to our churches. My kid, listen, I've been in fundamental... I have never, never been in a liberal church. I've been in a conservative fundamentalist churches all my life, and I know how they are. Holier than thou, act like that we're better than them, act like that we don't do anything wrong, act like that, oh, the world, they're all that. You can, that not only are they going to hell, let them go to hell. That's how we are sometimes. Very judgmental. Verse 33, when Jesus therefore saw her weeping, and the Jews also weeping, which came with her, he groaned in the spirit and was troubled. And he said, where have you laid him? Now, I want you to pay attention to your Bible. Where have you laid him? They said unto him, Lord, come and see. John eleven thirty five. 35, Jesus wept. Who was he weeping for? Who was he weeping for? Huh? He's weeping for Lazarus. Lazarus is his friend. So what do you get out of that, Pastor? Jesus was a friend of sinners. Lazarus is the sinner. And Jesus is weeping for him. Remember when the angels rejoice? Is it, do the angels rejoice every time I ask somebody to say amen at my preaching? When do they rejoice? When a sinner comes to repentance. Jesus weeps for the sinners. Because he's, he's their friend. And in some cases, you listen to me. In some cases... Maybe he's the only friend they got. Because sometimes it certainly ain't the church people. Because we get too embarrassed when we're around them. Like they're going to dirty us up or something like that. Okay? And I am just as guilty. So Jesus wept. Then said the Jews, Behold how he loved him. See it? Verse 37. Good night, guys. We love you. Thank you, Ron. This made my whole day. And some of them said, Could not this man which opened the eyes of the blind have caused that even this man should not have died? And again, what was Jesus let him die on purpose? I mean... The greater miracle was not going to heal him before he died. The greatest miracle was to heal him after he died. Because like I said, people get healed from diseases all the time. Medicines kick in. Surgery works. Okay? My back don't hurt hardly at all anymore. Now maybe that was God. Maybe, it, But it, you know, if I would have died in surgery... And then Jesus would have brought me back to life. That would have been better than my back being healed. I'd have a far better story to tell everybody. You see what I'm saying? Listen, God knows what he's doing. You quit, quest you quit doubting him. So what if he's going to let somebody die? So what? So what if the prophet promised the Shunammite woman that she was going to have a child and then God turned around and let that baby die? In her arms. God had a greater plan. 
and it was to bring that child back to life. Okay? Yeah, when so-and-so in your family was young, yeah, they, they went to church with you when you all were little, and uh, you were hoping maybe they would get saved, but it just didn't take. God had a far better plan than saving them when they were kids. Who in here got saved when you were a kid? Who didn't? See that? God had a far better plan for you, Melissa. John, God had a far better plan for you. Boy, I need this. You have no idea how I need this. Now look at verse 38. Jesus therefore again groaning in himself, coming to the grave. And it was a cave and a stone. What have we been talking about all this time? A stone. A stone lay upon it. Now look at verse 39. Liam, I want you to be quiet for a little bit. Okay? I want everybody to pay attention. Here's the point. Here it's 8 o'clock. If you want to leave now, go ahead. You're dismissed. Here's, here's the point. Jesus said, Take ye away the stone. Jesus did not put that stone there. They did. This is a stone of offense. And here's what we do. We write people off that are lost. We write them off. They're never going to get saved. They're never going to give... They're never going to get right with God. They're never going to... I'm, I'm done with them. We write them off. And then we put a stone of offense. See, here's the dead man. And here's the Savior. And what is separating those two? The stone. The stone is what is keeping the dead man from the resurrection man. And who put it there? They did. That's why he told them to take ye away the stone. You offended somebody. You got righteously indignant with people. You thought you were justified in it. And so you put the stone of offense there and turned around and walked away. He said, it doesn't matter, they're dead anyway. And then we come to church and we act real spiritual. Oh, if Jesus would have just saved so and so, it would have been better. He told a story, and I'll never be able to tell it right, but it had to do with a woman who was constantly, she was one of these that, Every service, they'd take prayer requests. Pray for my husband. Pray for my husband. He's lost. He's lost. He's lost. And there was an evangelist in that town that week. And God just would tell the evangelist things. And she did that during the night of a revival. Pray for my husband. Pray for my husband. And that preacher had detected that that woman had just been an absolute Jezebel at home in front of her lost husband. And he started, I mean, he started getting her... He was preaching to her. He was nailing her to the wall. And she got so much under conviction. I don't know how the story went. But the bottom line was that woman went home and confessed her sins to her husband. And that man broke and got saved. The stone... Our stone of offense that we put in front of lost people is what's keeping them. They can't, they're dead. They can't do anything. And we put a stone of offense in front of them and say, there you are. You're lost, you're probably going to hell anyway, I give up. And I have had to go back to people 
in my righteous indignation. And I've had to apologize to people. When Reg preached this message, I got, I got under conviction. I'll tell you what I did. I'll tell you one of the things I did. Sterling was with me one Saturday, and, and the Jehovah's Witness came to my door. Two ladies. And, buddy, I shredded them right on my doorstep. I mean, I got into it with them, and I threw Bible verse after Bible verse at them, and I shredded them. And I, 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 they, listen, I, I don't know how they must have felt. But I tore them to pieces, standing there on my front doorstep. Slammed the door in their face. Go on, get out of here. And God got me under such conviction about that. Did you know that I went to the Kingdom Hall of Jehovah's Witness on a Thursday night? over here on 110 Highway looking for those two ladies. Now, you want to talk about being in the hall of Satan itself. I walked in that building, and I want to tell you something. My spirit did not agree. And there was a man that met me at the door. said, they're very suspicious. Any new people coming in. And he said, can I help you? And I asked him, I said, there's two ladies that came to my house and I said, I want to apologize to them. And he went. I said, I don't know if they go here. Or he said, there's another one out at Cedar Hill. Where do you live? And I told him. He said, you're in the Cedar Hill district. I said, well, I said, if you know of them, and I described them, I said, if you know of them, would you relay the message? They were out at, and I gave him the address. I said, they were out at my house on a certain Saturday. And I said, I just about called them every clean name in the book and I said would you let them know that I am very sorry for how I treated them and they none of them knew what to say and afterward I talked to Brady about it and he knew the ladies and I said and I told the guy I said now I do not believe that you guys are right doctrinally I said but I was wrong and how I treated those two women. Would you let them know that I'm very sorry? And I turned around and walked out. Okay, now that does not a guarantee that these two ladies are going to be in heaven with me for all of eternity. But I'm the one who rolled the stone of offense there. And it was my responsibility to roll it away so that the light of the Savior and His Word could reach into the tomb of the dead man. How did Jesus raise that man from the dead? With his word. And what's holding, what's preventing his word from reaching into their heart is the stone of offense that you put there. So anyway, let's look at it. Take ye away the stone, Martha. Martha, the sister of him that was dead, saith unto him, Lord, by this time he stinketh. Do you see the protest? By this time he stinketh, Lord. We, we don't... And I want to be honest with you. There are some things that even church people don't want uncovered. We're afraid that, boy, if we meddle in this, if we try to reach out to them, why, they may uncover all kinds of things that we don't... That Lord, Lord, that, he stinketh. No, no, let's not do that. For he hath been dead four days. How many Gospels are there? Jesus saith unto her, Said I not unto thee, that if thou wouldest believe, that thou shouldest see the glory of God. Don't you trust God? Don't you trust Him? Then they took away the stone from the place where the dead was laid. Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank thee that thou hast heard me, and I knew that thou hearest me always, but because of the people which... Stand by, I said it, that they may believe that thou hast sent me. And when he had thus had spoken, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. And he that was dead came forth, bound hand and foot with grave clothes. And his face was bound with a napkin. Jesus saith unto them, Loose him and let him go. Now you would not believe the things that I've had to apologize for to people. 
Okay? But it was a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense that in my lifetime I have rolled in front of people. And some, I will probably never get the opportunity to roll that stone away, and i got to live with that. And I'm not happy about it. I've had to apologize to preachers. I apologized to the pastor who was our pastor here right, uh, right after Lisa and I got married. And I tried to have him run off. I was guilty. I wasn't alone, I can tell you that. But you know, they always say turnabout's fair play, right? Okay? I had the opportunity, I saw him at a preaching conference out of Pigeon Forge, Tennessee. And I said, I want to talk to you for a minute. And he said, okay. And I said, oh, you an apology. For what? And I told him, I said, I was young, I was arrogant, I was cocky, I was full of myself. I thought I could do it all. I thought I knew better. And I said, I didn't do you right, and you knew it. That's why when it came time for me to go and God sent me to Richwoods to pastor, you were all for it. And I said, I want you to know that I'm deeply sorry. He said, Mike, don't worry about it, I forgive you. He died the next year. God put me in his path so that I could take away a stone of offense. I did the same thing with Ken Golf, And I had to go back to him and say, Brother Ken, you wouldn't believe the places that God has taken me. And now I'm here in front of you and I need to ask your forgiveness. I was young, cocky, arrogant, full of myself, didn't do right thought I knew better than the aged preachers. And it's just been one thing after another with me. Having to go to people and apologize and confess things that I didn't want to confess. So when I'm giving this to you guys and you guys online, I'm not beating you over the head with it. I've had to do it probably have to do it again. Okay? So I know we've already had some prayer time. But I think it'd be good if maybe we could just come and we could ask God to give us opportunities to go back to some Lazaruses and roll away some offenses. Okay? Father in heaven, to be real honest before you and before your people today, my pride in my flesh hates preaching this. Because it means that I have to humiliate myself to some people and confess things that I don't want to confess and apologize for things because I have laid stones of offense toward people. Some of them, Lord, I, I know that I've done it. And Father, there's no doubt in my mind that there's some people out there in this community or in this county or 
who have come this way, God, that I have offended, not in a righteous way, not in a gospel preaching way, but I have offended them, and I'm not aware of it, but they're not around. Father, would you, would you help me take away the stones of offense that I have laid down to some people? I'm already, Lord, fighting off what I'm asking you. But God... Before I die, I would like my conscience clean. And maybe not everybody that I do this, Lord, is going to be saved. I'm not in charge of that. But Father, help us in our lives to take away the stone of offense. I pray, dear God, Lord, that you would be kind to us and merciful to us, Father. And Lord, this, this, kind of, uh, this kind of lesson, Lord, is hard. It's hard to do. Because there's things in us, God, that don't want to do it. But Lord... I'm all the time saying, Lord, do this for your kingdom's sake. Do this for your glory's sake. Do this for your sake. Lord, I'm all the time saying that. And Lord, I have to abide by it. I have to, Lord. My life has to be in line with glorifying your kingdom. And if it's not, Lord, then you have to put me out and bring somebody else in, Lord, whose life is. Father, I pray, dear God, that you would help us, dear God, with this issue. This is a big issue, Father. There are many offenses, Lord, that we have laid down in our lives. Some of them, Lord, are just, they're gone. It's been years ago. People have been gone for a long time, never going to see them again. Maybe some of them are dead. We're not going to get that chance back. But, Father, with those that still remain, maybe there is one out there, Lord, that, they want to meet the Savior, but we put the offense there. We rolled the stone in front of, between them and you. And I just pray, dear God, that you give us the wisdom and the grace, dear God. You know how hard this is for us. But God, that you would give us the wisdom and the grace and the opportunity to take away the stone. Father, I love you. I love your word. I love this church. And Lord, if I've rolled a stone of offense in front of anybody, God, would you give me the opportunity to take that stone away? I love you, Lord, and I'm going to give this to you, and I'm going to ask you, Lord, to do what seemeth right, Lord, in your eyes, for your kingdom's sake. And I want to put my trust in you in this, God. Thank you, God, Lord, for dealing with us, for speaking to us. Teach us to walk in your light and your ways. We love you in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, Amen. You would not believe how my flesh is fighting that off. You not believe. Let's stand to our feet tonight. Father, we love you. We pray, dear God, that you dismiss us in your care. Thank you, Lord God, for meeting with us tonight. Pray, Lord God, that you would Send revival in this place, dear God. Use us for your glory and your kingdom's sake, God. And I mean that. 
We pray this in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, Amen. Amen. God bless you. You're dismissed.